Hi, I'm Pastor Dennis Platt. I'm the Senior Pastor of the Word Christian Fellowship in Minto, New South Wales. And I'm also the Principal of Vision Colleges, the best Bible college on or off the internet. We've been running a series on one of our subjects, which is called Great Words of the Gospel by Ken Chant. It's one of his studies, and it's a subject that looks at all of those confusing words that we struggle with so very many times. Well, so far we've worked through redemption, regeneration, justification, predestination, and this time I want us to look at sanctification. Now, why do we do this? Why are we looking at these words and trying to bring some meaning to them? Well, because they are rarely used in churches anymore. Indeed, in many Bible colleges, not used anymore. The problem is that these torturous words sometimes, as they do seem that way, they're being dumbed down. But these words are pregnant with meaning. There's power and authority in these words, and we need to understand that. But when you dumb the words down you, and replace them with substitutes, the substitute expression does not carry the same weight and strength as the original word. And so the consequence is that the people of the church are being fed a watered-down gospel. And as you get a watered-down gospel, Gospel, it loses its power and strength and then you lose the power and strength of the gospel that God has for you. So it's important. Now, I don't mean to say that we shouldn't explain these words. Indeed, we should. It's important, imperative indeed, to make sure that people understand. But to understand them, we need to understand what the words mean. Not so much what the substitute means. So here we go. Sanctification. What does sanctification mean? Well, let's begin with this scripture. and We will come back to it soon. Paul says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate from them, says the Lord, and, I, and touch nothing unclean. Then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And since we have these premises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. When you look at that scripture, that's one tall order. It's, it's, it's one of those scriptures that cause us to scratch our heads and, and think and wonder what's going on. And it, it tends to gender within us this idea of sanctification is all about what I have to do in order to please God. And of course, as soon as I start to do that, I'm, I'm getting everything back to front. You already please God. You already please him. He loves you so much he sent Jesus. And we're going to see that sanctification is not really the, the monster that I guess it appears to be when you first look at that scripture. Trying to understand what sanctification means is, is not always easy and it is very misunderstood. The New Testament writers used several words but the root word is hagios and that means to be sanctified or holy. Now, How important is this concept? Well, the importance of a word, the importance of a concept, can be gauged in the Bible by the number of times it's actually found in the Bible. So let's have a look at this. Hagios, or holy, is found 280 times in the New Testament alone. And the, the Hebrew word, the Chaldean word, is found even more often in the Old Testament. But we're just staying with the New Testament, just to give us some kind of an idea. So for something to be found 280 times in the New Testament alone helps us to understand that it is very important to us. It's very important to God and that we have to get our heads around that and understand what it all means and how to apply this to us. The basic idea is to be separated and to be set apart for a holy purpose. That really is the, the meaning. 
And that setting apart can be something which has been made holy from the start, such as the utensils that may be used in a church, perhaps the the, the communion cups and plates, they've been set aside specifically and created for the very purpose. Perhaps the cross that you might find in your church or, or very many other instruments that are found in the church itself. They've been made to be holy and they are made and sanctified for that particular purpose. Another concept though is something which is not made holy but is separated from an unholy state to a holy state and that's you and me we've been created or made we're born in sin and iniquity and we live our lives in a dreadful manner and then we come to know jesus christ as savior and suddenly we've been separated we've been made holy we've been sanctified and then the third concept of this is something which is continuing to be used in sanctification. And that is the third element that we'll be looking at. It does rather mean something too that will startle a good number of people. The basic theme of the Bible is not salvation. Although for most people, the idea of the Bible is it's a book of salvation. And of course salvation is found in there. But... The very basic idea of the Bible is not so much salvation as sanctification. That is bringing men and women into the relationship of holiness with God so that they can have fellowship with him. Salvation is the first step in the process, as Paul expressed in his letter to the Corinthians. And of course, this was where we started. Therefore, come out from among them. Because you've been sanctified, says Paul, come out from among them, be separate from them, says the Lord. Don't touch anything unclean. I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. Now, here's something I really need you to get your head around because this is so important. Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthian church, says, because you have been sanctified, because God has set you aside, because he's made you one of his people, come out from among them and don't live like everybody else, but live as is fitting for the children of God. That is what Paul is trying to get across to us. You see, sanctification is the act by which God separates believers from sin to himself. This is something God does. We don't earn it. We can't make it. We can only keep it. But I want you to notice something. This is something which God uses. This sanctification is the means by which God separates us from sin unto himself. It is from that position that we now begin to walk in sanctification. This is really exciting because so many of us seem to have the idea that I've got to stop, 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 stop in order to be acceptable to God. But no, God is saying, because you're acceptable to me, don't do these things anymore. Try at least, at least try not to do them. That's what sanctification and walking in sanctification is about. So as we see here, we are set apart for a holy purpose. We are then made holy and we express this holiness in our lifestyle. That, that is what it's about. And understand that the first two parts of that are in fact the work of God. By the Holy Spirit, we are separated from the world and brought into relationship with God. By Christ and his work, we are given a holy character and then it's up to us to continue to walk in that to the very best of our ability. And I want you to understand something right now. We do that to the best of our ability. It's an individual and personalized ability that God is expecting us to walk in. We are not all the same. We're not all at the same place at the same time. We might all be on the same journey. We might all be running the same race. But you need to understand that God is a God of the individual, not a God of the mass. Even though the mass is made up of individuals. But he's a God of the individual. And he's going to expect us to walk in that way. 
So here we find the first basic meaning of sanctification. Something is set apart for God's purpose, by God's own choice and command. In much the same way, you know, you go shopping, you see a particular item, and you decide that you want that particular item, and you purchase it. You set it aside for your own personal use. Let's ponder on this thought for just a moment. We cannot stop thanking God for you, dear friends, beloved of the Lord, because before time began, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through your belief in the truth. Indeed, we've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. Do you see what is happening there? Is that God has chosen you by Jesus, by the work of Jesus Christ. He has chosen you. He set you apart. He sanctified you because you are worth the work that Jesus of the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at the next part. So we've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But is that all? The second part, the second aspect of sanctification, is not just being set apart from the world, but now being enabled to live an inwardly holy life. So we move from a state of separation to a state of grace in Christ and sanctification, so that we are now enabled to start doing the things that God wants us to do, the things for which we've been called to do, the things that he created us for in the very first place. By the will of God, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. See, it was determined purpose of God to provide the means by which you could sanctify, not just calling you to be sanctified, but then making it possible to be sanctified. Accordingly, we who now believe in Christ are truly sanctified. That is, we are given the righteousness of God. We are made a holy people fit to serve the living God. Did you get to see that? Did you really? really? Accordingly, we who now believe in Christ are truly sanctified. That is given the righteousness of God. We are made a holy people. Will you stop trying? Will you stop making a great effort? Will you stop torturing yourself? Because that's what this sanctification is about. Is so you don't have to do something to be good enough, but so that you can recognize that God has welcomed you with open arms and released you into a walk. See, that's where the effort stops and the great joy and blessing of being a man or a woman of God begin. I am now walking in God's blessing by doing what he wants. Does that mean there's no effort required on my part? Well, to become sanctified, to be holy, no effort is required at all. Of course, staying sanctified might require just a little bit more for here we see something else follow after holiness if holiness has been accredited to you through christ it is for one reason only that you can go on to a holy life and you and i can do that we can follow after holiness we can chase the things of god that he wants us to do so he says pursue that sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Take care that you do not fail to obtain the grace of God. Do not be like Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He lost his opportunity to repent, though he sought it with great tears. We need to understand that this holiness, this sanctification is something that we have to apply our heart and mind to having obtained it we do not wish to lose it don't give up on sanctification just because it can be difficult sometimes to do what god wants you to do that's a given but having said that having said it's a given let's let's think about jesus and what he did 
for just a moment. Jesus suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify his people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go out to him outside the camp, for we cannot find here any lasting city, but we look instead for the city that is to come. So, what is it that the writer is trying to get us to understand? First of all, that the sanctification which you and I enjoy at this time came at a horrific price, and that horrific price was the price of Jesus and his blood. It was the price of Calvary. So he says, let us go out to him. Let us be the people that Jesus called us to be. And you do that by keeping your focus on what Jesus did and what he's calling us to do, on where he's wanting us to go, on how we are going to be the people that he wants us to be. We need to understand something. Whilst on the one hand, being sanctified is the work of grace of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus, and that walking in sanctify and that is kind of, that's kind of easy. That that happens. That's the work of God. Walking and doing the things God wants us to do isn't always easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes there is some effort associated. But we are empowered to do it in the same way that Jesus was empowered to do it. That's something that we really need to try and get our heads around. She so said, we're commanded to pursue that sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. The Greek word that's translated pursue has the sense of seeking after earnestly, following after something. The word literally means to pursue without hostility. And that's important to understand. So the idea is that holiness is something which is a desirable goal, that we should all press towards it with all zeal and effort that we have, but it's unlikely to be fulfilled in this lifetime. So first of all, let's understand that, yes, we should be pursuing after holiness, but we're not, probably not going to achieve perfect holiness in our lifetime. We've, we've been made sanctified and holy by God, and now he just wants us to do our best to walk in this glorious experience. We need to understand three things. That this thing of sanctification is a continuous work, and there's a whole string of scriptures there that you can do. It is a continuous work. We are going to attempt to be sanctified. And you know something? Whilst we will do our very best to be sanctified, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to do the wrong thing. We're going to go to the wrong places. Now, I'm not giving you permission to do that. What I'm saying is that God understands that we will fail and fall over. He understands that sometimes we will make mistakes. He understands that sometimes... We're just going to blow it. That's human. That's to be expected. And Paul goes on and on so many times about this, telling us that this is a continuous work of the Spirit of God. And so because it's a continuous work, he says we need to sanctify ourselves. It's an ongoing thing. We keep coming back to God for that sanctification and doing the best we can. And the third part about this is that it is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. This thing of sanctification is not something you and I achieve out of our own strength. It's something which can only be achieved through the work and the grace of the Spirit of God. So what does it mean then to live a holy life? How can you determine whether or not you're living up to the biblical standards? And indeed, what are those standards? That's so hard. It's it, it can come over as incredibly legalistic. And indeed, in many churches, these are legalistic things. And God does not want you or me or anybody to strive through legalism, to dot the I's and cross the T's and just make everything just so because the word says it is so. Because, you know, for every scripture to affirm this... I'll find something to deny that. So uh, how, how, how do we deal with this? Let's see if we can find some answers in the word itself. Well, it will actually help us to try and understand what holiness is not. 
It is not a state of sinless perfection in this life. And this bring this up because there are so many Christians that have the idea that somehow I can attain to sinless perfection and they will deny themselves, they will starve themselves, they will do everything that they can by following a set of rules and regulations. The idea of reaching a state of sinless perfection it really runs contrary to the injunction of a great deal of scripture. Paul is, and Peter and John are constantly talking to us about trying to attain this state. And that's because they know that we won't so easily. It is a goal that we try to achieve to the best of our ability. That is important to understand. Sinless perfection is not the goal. Pleasing God is. John Wesley, who was one of the great holiness preachers of this day, he makes a very wonderful statement. He says, we cannot ex expect to reach a place where every kind of sin without exception will become impossible. Yet at the same time, in the face of temptation, there are more than enough resources available to us in Christ to resist sin. We need to understand that sin is a problem, it is a real issue, and yet at the same time, it is something which we can overcome. He goes on to say, there is no necessity laid upon us to sin, yet we do sin. But victory over sin is always available. Wesley made the point, put it rather plainly, he said, it is not impossible for a Christian to sin, but it is possible for him not to sin. It is not impossible for a Christian to sin, but it is possible for him not to sin. It's important for us to understand. You see, what we're advocating is that we strive not to sin, that we strive to walk in this holy life of Christ but it's not achieved with a set of rules as so many would try and think that you can you you know you you cannot go to the theater or the dance hall you mustn't smoke or drink you mustn't wear jewelry or cosmetics you can't dress a certain way you can't do eat certain foods because if you do then you're not going to be holy and all of that is just a pitiful delusion because that's not what God has said to us at all. Paul said such rules and regulations as do not touch, do not handle, do not taste, they are self-defeating because as soon as we start to give ourselves those kind of rules, we try and break them. And we try and take the attitude of, well, rules are made to be broken. And indeed they are, and we found ourselves in sin, struggling with the issues that we're trying to overcome. Of course, one of the problems with this is that an expression of personal holiness may point us in different directions. What is holy for me may be different to what is holy for you. We are individuals and God is working on us and we need to walk in this holiness, in this sense of individuality. God moulds us for different person, personal reasons. It's probably the great blessing of the Pentecostal experience that holiness is based on the inner working of the Holy Spirit within us, not an external set of rules which we try and manufacture. John expresses it in a very colourful and very wonderful way. He says, The anointing which you've received from him remains in you so that you have no need that someone should teach you. For just as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is not a lie, just it's taught you to abide in Christ. Now, here's the thing. That anointing which we have teaches us to abide in Christ. The very expression of this talks about the way the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. If you would listen to the Spirit of God, if you would go where he is urging you to go, do what he's urging you to do, say what he is urging you to do, instead of trying to fulfill a set of rules and regulations, then we will achieve that state of holiness so much more easily and walk in that holiness so much more easily and walk with one another instead of judging one another because they're doing it different to us. 
Holiness is a, a way of life based on relationship with Christ himself. Holiness is amazingly positive and not negative. It's an affirmation of the relationship with Christ, not a denial of self. It's not a situation of prohibitions, but rather a walk of opportunity. Not something you get, but something you express because you already have it. This, this is the whole tenet of, of holiness, that it's something that I'm walking in which is a great blessing, something which I'm going to enjoy. And believe me, when we grasp the idea of holiness the way God wants us to, holiness is very much something that we want to enjoy and something which we will. Holiness is sanctification by faith. That's the key to this whole thing. It's something we're sanctified by faith. It's something which God does through us because we accept the work of grace in our lives. That's the thing to realise. This is what happens to us. We hear the gospel of salvation. We get to believe the promise of God and we yield to the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. That is what justification is about. It, sanctification is going to follow justification. Justification, I hear the gospel, I believe the promise, I yield to regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. Have a look at the similarity here with, justi with sanctification. To be sanctified, I hear the gospel of holiness, I believe the promise of God. I yield to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. This thing about being blessed of God, about walking in sanctification, is a part of my justification. It's a part of the relationship I have with God, which Jesus has already started within you. So just as you are justified as a result of faith, you are sanctified as a result of faith. But since faith is ultimately the gift of God, all of the glory of your sanctification belongs to God, not your effort, not my effort, not the rules, the regulations, the ideas that have bound us up. I'm, we are free in Christ, free to walk the way Jesus wants us to walk. It is a matter of grace. You cannot be saved by your works, neither can we be sanctified by works. Only those works that spring from faith are the promise of God. We've got to understand that this is what sanctification is. It's about walking in the joy and the fulfilment and the blessing of God. And it's so real. This idea of being sanctified is not stodgy. It's liberating. And it's wonderful. Because so many Christians are trying to walk in something. They're trying to attain something they already have and when you're trying to attain something you've already got then you're denying your possession and because you deny your possession you actually defeat the very thing that it's all about coming back to this it is the act by which God separates believers from sin unto himself we cannot make sanctification happen it is the work of God to bring blessing to his people we can choose to walk in sanctification and grow in grace and in the blessing of God. See, that's what it's about. Look, all I've been able to do is scratch the surface. Sanctification, something which is seen as stodgy, hard, difficult to get your head around, all about rules and regulations, is far better explained to you than, than the feeble attempt that I've made in this short video. Great words of the gospel by Vision Colleges, and that's what you need to get hold of. And how will I get hold of it? Well, here it is, right here, visioncolleges.net. Look it up on the net. Principal at Vision Colleges, send me an email to say to me, how can I get hold of a copy of Great Words of the Gospel so I can understand that? Or better still, how can I join the college and study the subject and really get to understand it? And if you're in a hurry, well, you can give me a phone call, 02 2077 and we'll be delighted to help you to get hold of it. And why should you get hold of this particular subject? Well, I'll tell you why you should get hold of this subject, why you should understand it, because, my dear fellow, my dear friend, you matter. You matter to God more than I can ever express. You matter, and your sanctification matters so much 
that Jesus sent his only begotten, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. So if you would believe, you would have eternal life. That if you would believe, you too would be sanctified, set apart, received by God as someone good enough. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. And nor does God. He already died for your sins. Jesus already died for the sins you've committed. And he just wants you to be part of the family. Will you pray with me? Father, we just ask in Jesus' name that you really help us to get our heads around this idea of sanctification and holiness and being the kind of people you want us to be and learning to walk your walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, I'm Pastor Dennis Plant, Senior Pastor of the Word Christian Fellowship and I'm the Principal of Vision Colleges and we'd just like to invite you to join the colleges, get hold of the books and until the next time, may the Lord bless you real good.